This is Michigan, and Michigan will survive anything. I'll tell you that right now. Who would ever thought that you can go out and win a national championship and lose in your head coach at the same time, right before the tournament starts? Big news in the Michigan camp. Bill Frieder accepted the job at Arizona State, and the athletics director up in Michigan said, Bill, you're not going to be on my bench. The adversity and the struggle made us focus, made us concentrate made us care about each other. It has been hectic. There's no question about that. Sometimes it seemed like an eternity as it unfolded, and other times it seemed like it happened in two seconds. To understand just how the 1989 Michigan Wolverines rose to the top of the college basketball world, you must start with the man who didn't make it all the way across the finish line. You know, for 16 years I've been there, and. Uh, this is the first time I had to buy a ticket to go to a game, and uh, it's just going to be different. Bill Frieder, Michigan-born, Wolverine bred. He coached Flint Northern High School to two state titles before returning to Ann Arbor as an assistant to Johnny Orr in 1973. I was very fortunate in 1980 when Johnny Orr went to Iowa State because I was the head assistant, and we were doing very well. I was fortunate to get the job. Cross into motion! Cross! Bill Frieder is a unique individual. The towel across the shoulder, disheveled hair, looking like a madman on the sidelines, jumping up and down. He was kind of a crazed genius in his own way. Manic, driven, obsessed. I had not heard the word multitasking at that point in history, but he, he was always doing at least two things. Everyone talks about, you know, mathematically how he was very smart, how he was very adept at playing cards and was kicked out of several casinos in Vegas. Just relentless. He started recruiting me out of high school right at around, you know, 15, 16 years old. You're looking down on the biggest house in college football, Michigan Stadium, Ann Arbor. Frieder oversaw a basketball program that fought for attention in the vast shadow cast by the football powerhouse next door. Basketball probably was taking a look as the number two sport. Maybe you could even look at it as the number three sport because it was football, football, basketball. We were just trying to win games as much games as we could and, and try to make it at least football, basketball in the same sentence. On behalf of some great Wolverines, let's go, let's go. I accept this trophy. The differences between Frieder and the legendary leader of the football program. Bo Schembechler couldn't have been more striking. Bo Schembechler and Coach Frieder is like night and day. You can't compare those two guys because Coach Schembechler has a hard-nosed blue-collar approach. Bill Frieder was a player's coach. He's full of energy, very honest, a guy that, you know, really seemed to care about the person and not just the athlete and what the athlete could do for his basketball program. Sometimes he'd come to practice in flip-flops and have that kind of demeanor around the guys, which is kind of laid back. He wasn't a huge X as an old guy, but he brought in the right combination. And he said, hey, guys, go out there and you get it done. Tarkley, the game is over. Despite winning the NIT in 1984 and the regular season Big Ten title in 1985 and 1986, continued NCAA tournament flameouts haunted Frieder's program throughout the decade. It was like something was always missing. You always need that key shot or that key turnover or something, and we never got that stop, and we never got that key shot. You'd go to the gym, and there'd be signs out there, fire free. They'd chant that fire freeder. Because, you know, again, team, the team was so much talent, never got to where it was supposed to get to. Anytime you fall a little short of expectations, the, the fans aren't happy. But we lost in 85, we lost to the Villanova team that won the national championship, and we played them better than any other team did. When you take a look at his records through the years at Michigan, they were very good. But everyone looked at this crazy wild guy that's on the bench. 
so I don't think he was ever given the kind of respect that you would expect a Michigan coach to have. Arriving in Ann Arbor in 1984, Gary Grant quickly cemented his position as a leader for the Wolverines, earning consensus All-American honors in 1988. We call him the general. When you talk defense at the University of Michigan, his name got to come up first. He was the glue that took us to the next level, which was winning Big Ten championships. In 1988, after the maize and blue fell to North Carolina in the NCAA tournament for the second straight season, the Michigan point guard torch passed from Gary Grant to Ramil Robinson, who had scored 29 points in the loss to the Tar Heels. I remember talking to Ramil Robinson after the game that we're going to go to the Final Four the next year. Ramil Robinson is the key to this basketball team, and we have to knock on wood and, and hope that he stays healthy. You know, the thing about Ramil is he was very sophisticated. He would dress well and present himself well. I always felt Ramil was kind of a, a grown man in a kid's body. Ramil was the type player where you couldn't really tell him nothing. But if he had his vision of doing it that way, he was going to do it that way. And that's what made him successful. It was a struggle for him. I mean, Ramil was a scorer. We had many conversations that, man, I don't know if I can do this. And I would just tell him, yes, you can. Just settle down and just be you. No Wolverine heeded the be you mantra more than the man who spoke those words. Sweet shooting senior Glenn Rice, who earned Michigan's Mr. Basketball at Flint Northwestern before moving on to Ann Arbor to lead the Big Ten in scoring as a junior in 1988. As hard a worker as I've seen, Glenn worked on shooting before practice, after practice, for four straight years. I would shoot at least a couple thousand a day. I would shoot until it almost felt like my arm was going to fall off. For me, that was my way of conditioning my, my body to continue to keep form for my jump shot. There were stretches in practice for him where he literally wouldn't miss shots. We'd play scrimmage games, and he'd go, you know, 12 for 12, you know, 15 for 15. I mean, just like, wow, because right? he was just that good. Glenn Rice was an incredibly quiet guy. When I first interviewed him early in his career, he could barely speak a sentence. Each year I became a little more vocal and understood that one day <laughs> I'll be asked to step into that leadership role. Rice's leadership skills faced an early challenge in Sean Higgins, a California high school star who had yet to fulfill his tantalizing potential at Ann Arbor since his controversial arrival the previous season. <laughs> When they avoided the letter where he could not go to UCLA, then he wanted to come to Michigan. He called me, said, Coach, can I still come to Michigan? I thought he was kidding. I got humbled when I got on campus. You know, first of all, Glenn Rice humbled me, you know, because he was the first guy to really teach me what it was about to play hard on every possession. Oh, yes, he did. I was on Sean Higgins constantly. We always say, Sean, you a knucklehead. This guy had unbelievable talent. It's just that, you know, a lot of times he, you know, he would take nights off. The change with the greatest repercussions to the basketball program came from above. When Bo Schembechler took the reins as athletic director in the summer of 1988, replacing the retiring Don Canham. I love Don Canham. The fact that he had coached, I think, gave him a lot of stability in staying with his coaches. He and Canham were kindred spirits in many ways. Canham was a showman and a guy who liked to buck and very focused. You've now got a legend that's the athletic director. I mean, Bo Schembechler was Michigan. There's no question about that. And Bo is bigger than life. I love Bo. Bo always, I thought, supported basketball, and I thought we were good friends. Bo and Frieder got along quite well until Bo became the AD. And then once I'm your boss, the things that are different than my style become a problem, become friction points. My first experience of actually beating Bo, he said, you know what Michigan time is? 15 minutes early is Michigan time. So if you're not there before class, 15 minutes early, then you're late for class. When Bo came in and he had Freed's, it was like night and day. 
And I think that might be why Freed's was maybe trying to take a look at leaving. Both teams dressed in blazers, ties, and shirts. Freeders teams dressed in sweatpants when they went on the road. You know, jeans and t-shirts, sweatpants, whatever they had on. And then that drove Bowie nuts. And Freeder knew, he knew. He saw the writing on the wall. Michigan began the 1989 season ranked third in the country. And seniors Mark Hughes and Glenn Rice set lofty expectations for the Wolverines. Glenn and I remember talking before practice, man, this is it. We talked about winning the Big Ten title, we talked about winning the national title. This is our last chance to get it done. The Wolverines lived up to the hype out of the gates, thrashing number four Oklahoma en route to winning the Maui Classic. Neal with the ball, going oh, for two. Oh. I didn't think he had anything. At that time, we understood that we're a pretty good team, and we wanted to come out and show it right away. Numbers, yep, Michigan's got them. The big guy. Oklahoma had two legitimate pro players. So beating that team gave this team a lot of confidence and gave the coaching staff a lot of confidence. And the buzzer goes and Michigan Wolverines have won themselves the Maui Classic. This team was ranked second in the nation through most of November and December. People were thinking early in that year, this is the year this team can really do it. They've got all the pieces, and they really did have all the pieces. A holiday tournament game against Division II Alaska Anchorage marked the start of a difficult winter. Coach Fisher told me at the time I was a young assistant, he said, we'll be able to name the score of this game. That was not only stupidity, but that was the thought that every player on our team must have had because we got beat. I remember Coach Frieda was disappointed. But it's like, hey, guys, you know, this is not how you win. You know, you have to continue to fight. You can't overlook anybody. The losses began to mount in January. First to second ranked Illinois, then a crushing road loss to Wisconsin that stung the Wolverines point guard. Ramil has a chance to hit some important free throws to essentially win the game, uh, and he missed. Robinson shot is on the way, no good. Ramil is devastated, and all he kept saying is, next time I get that opportunity, I'm not gonna blow it. We come home right after the game, Ramil says to me, will you wait and rebound for me? So I went out, I rebounded as Ramil shot 100 free throws. He says, I'm never gonna have that kind of moment again. He needs help now. Bills from outside. Hughes follows. That's the one that usually wins in the offensive rebound. And time has run out. In oh, here yeah, has I'm done celebrating. it. Two days later, the Wolverines fell to Indiana. But the February rematch with the Hoosiers in Bloomington changed the course of the Michigan season. Pickett, three-pointer. Indiana trailed 75-73 with seconds left, but worked the ball into the hands of star guard Jay Edwards. Are you sitting in the locker room after you know, a tough loss like that? And it just didn't make sense to us. I think it sent the message to us that we have to take this into our own hands. We can't let other people decide it for us. At that point, I was like, look, you know what? We need to be on a mission to shock the world. That's how we got to think. We don't need to leave nothing on the table. We go out there, we put in the work. We believe in one another. We fight for one another. When Glenn made that call out, he had tears in his eyes. At that point in time, we never seen Glenn feel that way, and it was just, it was unreal. We're good. You know, we're good, and we can beat anybody we play. I can remember him saying that. We're good, and we can beat anybody we play. Yeah. On a mission following Glenn Rice's fiery speech in the wake of a second loss to Indiana, the Wolverines cruised to five straight victories, including a 119-point explosion against Iowa. What's interesting about the 89 team is they seemed to play better when their backs were to the wall. They played a lot better. We really believed in ourselves. We didn't think that we were supposed to lose any game. You know, those were games that we just felt that we should have won. Senior day at Chrysler marked the end of the regular season as Michigan welcomed number four Illinois. A statement game proved to be just that. 
for the Flying Illini. It's like, wow, this is it for us, guys. Our last game here in Chrysler. It's emotional. Next thing you know, the floodgates opened up, man. And wow, those guys were very impressive. If you take a look at that Illinois team, they were athletic. They could jump, they could run, they could shoot, they could defend. They were just flat out tough. It was a smackdown like I've never seen in a big game that Michigan played. There's the lob. 89 to 73 was the final score, and it was much worse than that. When we went back in that locker room after that game, I think every player probably sat there for at least an hour and a half to two hours before we even started to take showers. I think that one really hurt. The one thing I told the guys, I was like, yeah, you know what? This has to hurt. This has to hurt worse than any game we have lost this year. Had to. Because it's going to prepare us going into the NCAA tournament. Seated third in the Southeast region, the Wolverines prepared to travel to Atlanta to face Xavier. But prior to leaving, Michigan's world was turned upside down. I like Bo, but when he became AD, things changed a little for Michigan. So that concerned me a little that he made changes on basketball. My wife and I discussed it, and that's when we decided maybe it's uh, uh, time to, to look elsewhere. Bill called me over after practice and informed me. He said, I'm going to need you to take the team. I'll meet you in Atlanta. I'm going on the red eye to Phoenix and be announced as the Arizona State coach. I did tell Arizona State when the season was over I was going to take the job. And word started to leak out. And would I do it differently today? Probably. But the whole thing was about being honest. I do regret the time. And you know, all I can say is there'll be some negatives about me at that end, but I think what's negative at that end is going to be positive at this end. I feel bad about my players, and I talked to every one of my players last night. He probably called every single player on the team and just basically said that he had to make a decision, and his decision was he was going to take a job at Arizona State and just told us as men and say, you guys understand that once you get older. I had a conversation with Fred. I said, Fred, I understand. I understand, you know, you don't want to leave Michigan, but, you know, you have a family. You got to do what's best for your family. Your other family, which was us, we understand. Fred's thought that if he would do this, it would get everything off everybody's back so there wouldn't be the rumors and it wouldn't be on the team's back. That's why Frieder took the job at that time. But it, it didn't work out. <laughs> Bill Frieder hoped to coach the Wolverines in the NCAA tournament, a request denied by Bo Schembechler. I talked to Bo Wednesday morning. He just told me I can't let you coach a team in the tournament. And I said, I respect that. And I said, but you got a good man that can coach it. Make sure you give it to Coach Fisher. And he says, well, that's what I'm planning on doing. In a way that only Bo Schembechler could say it, uh, said that Bill was not going to be coaching the team and that I was going to be the interim coach at Michigan. Can you do the job, he said. Steve Fisher, in his seventh season as Frieder's assistant, would make his college head coaching debut in the unforgiving spotlight of the NCAA tournament. You could count on Steve. Steve was loyal. You could win a huge game and a big dinner plan and decide at the last minute you got to send them recruiting. It wouldn't bother them. Coach Fisher had always been vocal in practice. You know, he wasn't an assistant coach that just stood on the sidelines. To prepare the team for the coaching change, Bo Schembechler ripped a page from his football playbook and gave a speech for the ages. The next day in Ann Arbor News, it said if Higgins doesn't like the new coach, he'll transfer or turn pro. And so that's what led to Bo Schembechler coming down to Chrysler Arena and giving us his motivational speech. Bo Schembechler gave us the most unbelievable motivational speech to this day of my life. Made us believe that we could climb the highest mountain. Made us believe we can run through the thickest wall. 
He said that, you know, Coach Fisher is going to be the guy to coach you guys. And then all of a sudden, he just went at on a tangent about some of everybody. And he looks at us and he says, you guys need to make sure you play in the game the right way. Play for the name on the front of your chest, not the name on the back. Bo went around to each individual. Emil, you're the quarterback of this team. You need to be the one who takes this team, you know, and runs it on the court. Mills, you're the strong guy. We need that strength underneath. Then he gets the shot. And he said, son, if I hear one more word out of you, I'll have your transfer papers on my desk in the morning. Do you understand me? And, you know, I just sat back. I, wow, Bo Schimbecker recognized who I am. We just heard from the mightiest Michigan person ever. How are we going to let him down? And how are we going to let ourselves down? As soon as practice is over, they have a press conference. And I'm introduced to the press. I don't want somebody from Arizona State coaching a Michigan team. I want that understood. A Michigan man is going to coach Michigan. And uh, so that's the way it will be. It's classic defiant ball. And Frieda was hilarious about that. He goes, Michigan, man, I got two degrees from Michigan. How many does Bo have, you know? But near zero, so. so but that's not what a Michigan man means. A Michigan man is, is Bo. Bo is a Michigan man. I'm not a Michigan grad, but I pride myself in now being a Michigan man, and I'm happy and proud to be here and hope that I'm around here for a long time. I'm thinking, OK, you know what? Fine. Shake this off. Go talk to Fisher. Let him know, look. We're 110% behind you. Enjoy the ride. Told him just like that. Enjoy the ride. Because you know what? We're still on our mission. At Terry Mills' house, right before we went into the tournament, when we found out Frieda was not going to be our head coach, I go to the hallway to use the restroom, and, and I hear something that sounds like whimpering. And so I knock on the door, and, and I ask Rice, I ask him, Rice, you OK? And he opens the door, and his eyes are full with te filled with tears. By no means was, was I trying to shed tears in front of him. It just happened. The emotional connection I had with my teammates was for real. That passion he had that day in Terry Miller's apartment, that's why we kick people's butt, period. That's it. You can talk about Fisher. You can talk about B B Bo Schimbeckler. You can talk about all that stuff. We, well, we were the guys who had to go out there and play. When the Wolverines touched down in Atlanta for their first round NCAA tournament game versus Xavier, Bill Frieder was gone from the sidelines, but not forgotten. Bo didn't want Bill to talk to the team. Bo wanted him excommunicated, and I didn't think that was fair either. When Coach Frieder came and spoke to us at the Omni Hotel in Atlanta, it really changed us. I know it changed me personally, because I finally figured that Coach really cared about us. We were his team. He recruited us all. I cried. Yeah, that was tough. That was very tough. Yeah. Yeah, I love those kids. I mean, those were all my kids. Those kids were a decade of hard work. He would always call before the game. He worked along with us, but he was behind the scenes. With Steve Fisher's coaching future uncertain, Michigan ready to face 14th seeded Xavier. I was so nervous before the first game, the most nervous I had ever been before a game. He looks at me and he says, um, you think I even have a chance of being named the head coach? And I said, I looked at him with straight face and said, yep, you sure do. All you have to do is win the next six games. We're playing Xavier. And I'm telling you, I am 99% sure if Fish doesn't win six games, Pete Gillen is the head coach at Michigan, the Xavier head coach. I would guarantee that. Bo loved him. Michigan appeared headed for another early tournament exit, trailing by six midway through the second half. And with Ramil Robinson saddled with four fouls, Fisher inserted little-used guard Demetrius Caleb. He comes and he puts his hands on my face and he's like, Demetrius, I need you to just play like you play back at Flint Northern. And that was kind of like a pressure release. Steve had faith enough in Demetrius to say, go out there, let's see what you're capable of doing. 
Let's see if you can shine in this moment. Caleb with it at the free throw line. 17 footer straight away. He got it! Demetrius Caleb with a big basket. He's got seven. We don't win game one against Xavier without Demetrius Caleb coming in and having, to that point, the game of his career. Fisher and the Michigan Wolverines move on to round two. They turn it on in the final five and defeat Xavier 92-87. Caleb's nine points in the final 10 minutes propelled Michigan to a second round matchup against South Alabama, where the Wolverines front court flexed its muscle. You got Loy Vaughn, who's really rebounding. Then Terry Mills has now become that interior player. He has become that dominant big guy down low, and he's tough to handle with his size, not only height, but also his weight. Coach Fisher said we wanted you to make a conscious effort on posting up, getting down in the post, being strong, and we will get you the ball. We will throw you the ball in there. And uh, I said, well, okay, Coach, that's fine with me. In the middle, kicks it back out the right, three-pointer straight away. Yes! Game's over, and the Wolverines have won it. The Wolverines move on to Lexington, Kentucky. Mills finished with 24 points and seven rebounds, but his effort was upstaged by Glenn Rice, whose exploits elevated him from merely great to legendary. 23 points against Xavier, 36 against South Alabama, and thoughts of vengeance filled his mind as the Wolverines prepared to meet North Carolina for the third straight year in the NCAA tournament. We wanted to punish them because of the pain that we have had up to that point of losing to them two years in a row. We wanted to get at them. Four seconds, Rice! No one could stop him. You put him in the corner, you put him at the top of the key, you put him behind that line, here comes the shot. It was one of the most amazing shooting performances of all time. They put J.R. Reed, who was a big, thuggish forward, brutish forward, and they were gonna hammer at every chance, and you couldn't stop him. No matter how many times he hit him, he could not stop him. Take his baseline right, right, three, four, he got another! He got another! Rice finished with 34, and the final two of Sean Higgins' 14 points iced a Michigan victory that left them one win away from the final four. Sean Higgins, if any time he had to ever step up was on a big stage like that, and he did, he passed the test. And it's over, and the Wolverines make it to the finals of the Southeast Regional. When you dream about this as a little kid to be in North Carolina, you see all the great Dean Smith teams out there winning championships and going to the Final Four every other year, and this is a dream for me. There was a sensibility of me feeling that I needed to come up in this game to show that I was the difference maker. And, and I think that's what was really on my heart throughout the whole tournament, to let people know that you didn't waste a scholarship on me. Looking to reach the Final Four for the first time in 13 years, Michigan faced fifth-seeded Virginia, and the Wolverines, only two weeks removed from a coaching change, steamrolled the Cavaliers. We go back in the locker room for sort of final instructions, and uh, Terry Mills walks in and says, you know, those guys are scared. I saw them warm up, and they're scared. Higgins three-pointer, and he got it! Sean Higgins with the three! And it was an offensive performance that people still talk about that Higgins and Rice from three-point range were unstoppable. Rice, another three-pointer, he got another! Rice, unbelievable! Virginia had a couple players on their team that I'd had some history with. Higgins, jump up. These guys are stepping in our way, so we got to go ahead and smack you up a little bit. Left wing pass to Higgins, turns, three-pointer on the way again, he got it again! Sean Higgins with six three-pointers. We're dropping bombs from everywhere. I mean, it was like shots going in here and there. Everybody got into the floor. Everything was clicking. Right side, Rice, three-pointer on the way, off the bench, he got it! Rice with 30 points. We felt that we could do no wrong. And when you feel like you can do no wrong, great things happen. The Michigan Wolverines move on. The first team into Seattle in the Final Four. 102-65 to as Steve Fisher, the interim head coach, moves on. 32 points from Rice. 31 from Higgins, and the Wolverines found themselves two wins from a national championship. Cutting down the nets after that was very special because you get up there and now it's like you're going to the Final Four. You're going to the Final Four. Yeah! 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 Yeah!
last two games, man. I, I can't believe you guys. It was so exciting after we beat Virginia. Now, remember, Bo said in the locker room, and the cameras were rolling, he said, you know what I want. I want Illinois. You know damn well you can win this whole thing. And you know what I hope? I hope we get Illinois. That's yeah. right. And as a young assistant, I'm going, wow, we better be careful what we wish for. Awaiting Michigan in the Final Four, a familiar foe, the Flying Illini, the only team to have beaten the Wolverines by double digits all season, a feat they accomplished twice. They're a great team. They're very athletic. They're a great defensive-minded team. But so what? We're a better team than that in all phases, and we're going to prove it. I got to give Coach Fisher credit here. They beat us, beat us, beat us to the glass. And Coach said, look, if we cut down on these offensive rebounds, guys will win the game. They are actually playing with some precision on offense, some cohesion on offense, which we hadn't seen all year. But they are actually making teams work on defense. That's how you beat Illinois. It's a grudge match down to the wire. Michigan took a punch, and Atlanta went right back. Punch, 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 punch. This is a heavyweight knockout battle. And I'll tell you what, no fan in that game could have ever asked for their money back. That was unbelievable basketball. Glenn Rice poured in 28 points. And with the score tied at 81 in the closing seconds, Michigan wanted their sharpshooter to take the final shot. The game plan was to get the ball to Glenn. Glenn was supposed to come off of a double screen, and I remember him coming off, and he wasn't open. Robinson back again, needs help. Cross corner goes to Terry Mills, baseline right with seven. In all actuality, I thought the shot was good. You know, it was straight. You know, he lined it up. He was squared to the basket. I'm not going to say it was out of my range, but I'm quite disappointed that I didn't make it, you know, because as years went on, I probably could make that shot in my sleep. Steve Fisher all year would talk about if they shoot it from the right side, you have to position on that back side. And Sean Higgins stepped in. He wedged Nick Anderson. Long range jumper misses. Rebound Higgins back up and in. And with two seconds. One second left on the clock. Illinois uses their last time out. Rebound basket. Sean Higgins. Missing it on top. 83-81 with one second remaining. Nick Anderson didn't box out. And, you know, a lot of people try to say that I pushed off on the rebound, which that's all Illinois fans that say that. Most of the time, people need the backboard to bank it in, or you might see a little bit of rim noise. That shot didn't hit nothing but the twine. Carter runs the baseline, launches it down court. Rice intercepts, the game's over! Michigan's going to the national title game Monday night! When I had the ball in my hand, I, I realized at that point that it was over. Uh, the mission was almost completed. <laughs> We felt vindicated from them having murdered us, you know, in the two previous games before that game, because this one was for all the marbles. This one was to go to the national championship game. We talk about our goals at the beginning of the year, win the Big Ten, win the national championship. Everybody says it, the national championship seems so far away, um, but we're here now and it's just like a dream come true because we've been saying this from day one. The lone hurdle between Michigan and their first ever NCAA basketball title, a 31-win Seton Hall team that defeated Duke in the other semifinal. Andrew Gaze was the hot hand of the tournament. He would really led them to the championship game. If we were going to win, I had to stop him. We thought we were the better team. Glenn played like Glenn. If there anybody else just stepped up a little bit, we thought we had a really good chance of winning us the national championship. Left side right, one step, he got the jam with the right hand. It reached the point, especially in Seattle, when a Glenn Rice miss was a surprise. Here's a high school responding with a three. Rice led Michigan with 31, earning the Most Outstanding Player Award with a tournament record 184 points in six games. The Wolverines built a 10-point lead before the second half evolved into a duel between Rice and Pirates guard John Morton. You could see that Seton Hall was building momentum, and now, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Like, uh-oh, this is getting close. And I think it was John Morton, he just started hitting the shots, you know, from everywhere. Seton Hall brings Morton up with the layup. The Hall's ahead. For me as a competitor, 
When you got somebody that's lighting it up on the other team, you accept that challenge. Nail-biting time. Rice off the screen. Three-pointer on the way. He got it off balance. Fred Rice with five three-pointers and 29 points. They could have had five Johnny Mortons out there, and we still felt that we could have won that game. And Morton with a hot hand. He'll jack up to three. With the score tied in the closing seconds, Rice had the chance to be the hero. Play was drawn up for me to come off screen and, and you know, get the last shot. Rice off the screen, turns, right hand jumper up, doesn't drop, rebound, Seton Hall, we're going to overtime. Now, that was a shot I hit with my eyes closed most of the time. It's just unfortunate, it just rolled right off the rim. Quickly, I was like, okay, don't worry about it. We're going into overtime. We still got our team. We still got our horses, and we're fine. Back out, Morton, three-pointer straight away. High archer, nothing but net for Morton. Morton with 35 in the game. Now, all of a sudden, they're three points ahead late in the game. With less than a minute remaining in overtime, Terry Mills cut the lead to one. And a Michigan defensive stop gave the Maize and Blue a chance for the win. Seton Hall will have to hurry. Morton will go one-on-one -on -one up high. We obviously elected not to take a timeout when we secured the rebound. We gave the ball to our point guard that had led us all year. We wanted the ball in his hands. He pushed the ball to the basket. They've got to hurry. Five seconds. Robinson goes in his oh. foul call with three seconds. A foul against Seton Hall with three seconds. I've actually talked to Johnny Morton about this, and they're all convinced, of course, it was not a foul. It was a tough call. Was there a bump? Yeah. Did he have to call a foul? He called a foul. And I think that most of the game, they had been consistent with how they had called it. Neil Robinson with an opportunity to put Michigan ahead. When they called timeout, you know, we all headed back into the huddle. No one really said anything to Ramil. It's kind of like, let's leave Ramil alone. And he knows what he has to do. I remember we lost to Wisconsin earlier in the year and he missed two free throws that could have won the game for us. So it's poetic justice that Ramil was presented another opportunity to be in that situation. Ramil, a couple of deep breaths. Free throw is up and it's in! Nothing but that for Ramil Robinson. We've got a tie ball game. He's got 20. 79 all with three seconds remaining. I looked at Ramil and he's standing there by himself. I have to give him some words of encouragement. And there's a phrase that Ramil always used, and that was, God helps those that help themselves. And I said, well, that's probably a perfect thing to tell a guy who's sitting there with the weight of the world on his shoulders. We're either going to win it or we're going to play another five minutes. But my thought was, we don't want another five minutes. We want this to end and end now. Me personally, I had no doubt about it. He was prepared for that moment. Robinson, one more free throw, can put the Wolverines back on top, and he does! Nothing but that for Ramil Robinson with 21, 80, 79. Michigan up by one, three seconds remaining. And in that moment, Ramil Robinson won a national championship for Michigan. Ramos, baseball pass the other way. It comes to Walker and Green. Walker turns, forces, misses. Michigan has won the national title! say that it takes two or three weeks to set in the accomplishment. For me, it was instantaneous. I didn't know how to control the emotion. I was running all over the place. Instant, overcome with joy. I've never cried uncontrollably like that. I actually had tears. We made eye contact with my dad and my mom and brother got ushered down. I just remember so badly wanting to be on the floor and it just jump into my dad's arms and celebrate. We got onto the podium, then I'm kind of in a whirlwind to replay, reflect on what had just happened over a, a three-week period. I've seen all great players hold us and great teams hold us, you know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but this is, this is truly something right here. You know, all the guys that we came in here and we said, one, two, three, mission accomplished. I had a moment where I just sat back and I looked around at the players. I was taken aback because we had a mission. Great run for us. It was over 
because now we win a national championship. It's an accomplished, baby. Uh, yeah. Big Ten Elite is brought to you by Chase, so you can. Less than 24 hours after cleaning Michigan's first basketball championship, a joyous Wolverine team returned to Chrysler Arena to continue the celebration. We come in, and it's packed inside of here, standing room only. It's just enough room for us to walk down the middle and come up on stage. You come back, and you get an opportunity to be in front of them, and now they get to embrace the whole situation and enjoy the moment with you. That, too, is what it's all about. This championship will go down in history as one of the great accomplishments in all of Michigan athletics. An unknown assistant coach three weeks earlier, Steve Fisher was now a White House guest with his team soon to follow. President and Mrs. Bush, Steve and Angie Fisher, Millie the dog, we walk through the Rose Garden with security. You say, how could this happen to anybody? And it's happening to us. Go for it. Right here, we have a little demonstration. <laughs> Ramil got a chance to reenact the free throws on the Rose Garden in front of uh, George Bush Sr. and Vice President Quayle. Yeah. <laughs> President Bush gave Ramil the ball, and Ramil made the first one. And then he was supposed to take the second one. Everything, obviously, at the White House is very scripted. <laughs> And Ramil handed the ball to the president, and he said, Mr. President, you're the best under pressure. You make this one. I believe very strongly that you're going to see a new, fresh, exciting era of Michigan basketball. And so here's our new coach, Steve Fisher. Exactly one week after winning the title, Fisher had the term interim removed from his title when he was named head coach of the Wolverines. I didn't have a three-hour interview with Bo Schembechler. I had a three-week interview that he watched like the whole country did as we played. Bo gave Steve Fisher a head coaching job. He was interim head coach and kind of hard to fire the guy that just gave you a national title. To have an opportunity to be the head basketball coach at such a prestigious academic athletic institution such as Michigan defies description and words. A lot of people have asked, would this team have been able to do what they did under Steve Fisher if Bill Frieder had been head coach? Joe Blow, I think, could have sat over there and won that championship. And that's not to knock the coaches. I think, in a sense, it's giving praise to them because of how well prepared they had us. Bill Frieder was the architect of that era of Michigan basketball. He recruited every player on that team. He coached every player on that team. We gave Bill a championship ring. He hired me at Michigan. He gave me the opportunity to coach with him in that program. Forever indebted to that fact. I was very proud of him. I pulled for him every inch of the way. We won't know if it would have happened if I was the head coach, so that's why I've always had a positive attitude about it. We won the national championship. That's Michigan's greatest basketball accomplishment. A guy named Dan Morris had been sending me messages predicting our victories, preparing to play Seton Hall. He had sent me a message, don't worry about a thing, you're going to win, and Mark Hughes is going to be the hero of the game for you. Jamil Robinson comes down the lane. Had they not called a foul, I have the ball, and I have open lane to the basket, and, uh, you know, I got a feeling that my picture would have been on the cover of Sports Illustrated. 